And now to conclude our three uh, um, sessions on uh, the world, world War II, marking the end of uh, World War II, I'm delighted to introduce Nick Young, Sir Nick Young, former chair of uh, British Red Cross, who has written uh, the memoirs of his father. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about that and a bit about the fact that uh, Pat and Jean uh, wrote the memoirs of their father before then going into the book in detail. And what's then going to happen is uh, he gave an interview uh, at the Red Cross. We're going to play that half an hour interview uh, all about the book. Uh, and then we're going to come back and uh, ask him about that uh, as well. So Nick, welcome. Thank you for doing this. Um, they wrote their father's book, but he wanted uh, he wanted it published and they said he couldn't get it published. What was the position with your father? Well, uh, Dad is completely the opposite, actually. He never talked about the war at all. He never did anything uh, that I know of to bring together his wartime experiences. Um, literally, two days after he died, I found in his bedside table, amongst a whole bodge of other papers, a little scruffy old notebook. And when I looked into the notebook in more detail, the pages were just crammed with tiny cramped pencil scribble. And I realised it was a diary of some sort. And it took quite a while to, my father's handwriting was even worse than mine, it took me quite a while to work out that it was a, a diary of when he was in a prison camp in Italy and of his a period of six months or so when he was on the run uh, from the, the Germans in Italy. And eventually he got back to the Allied lines uh, just after, at Anzio, just after Allied forces had, had invaded. So um, unlike Pat and Jean's father, Dad um, gave me no help at all. And I don't know how he'd feel about my having brought his story into the public gaze as I have. I mean, I'm obviously incredibly proud of him. And it was a hugely, it's been a wonderful lifetime's mm -hmm experience of research gradually digging in not just to the Italian experience but what led up to that and my father's whole war which again he barely mentioned and uh, it's been great fun bringing that to life in a book of, of my own. Excellent well we'll go into the interview you were interviewed by Alexander Mathurl who's the international director of the British Red Cross uh, it's a fascinating interview uh, and then we'll take uh, I'll, I'll question you afterwards so for the next half hour Please watch um, uh, Nick's interview with Alexander Mathur. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexander Matthew. I'm the executive director of our international work here in British Red Cross. Nick, I had the pleasure to work with you for many years. I'm going to ask Nick a few questions about his book for about 20 minutes, and then I'll ask you if you have any questions. Then Nick, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll close out our session. Nick, before your sitting days, of the General Assemblies. <laughs> I remember your very first General Assembly, one of my first memories of you actually. You were standing on stage, you're the new CEO, and you're alone on the stage and you say, I wish my father had been alive to see me become CEO of British Red Cross because he would have been so proud knowing what this organization meant for him when he needed it the most. Clearly this story has been part of your life. You've been thinking about it for a long time. What made you finally get down and, and tell the story and go as far as writing a book of it? Well, I think what really struck me was a sense of gradually great sadness that my father had never taken the opportunity to tell me his story himself. And to my shame and sorrow that actually I never took the trouble or the time to sit him down and ask him to talk about it himself. I didn't know why he was silent about his war. Um, I know, of course, that many of the people who fought with him, that generation indeed as a whole, tended to think that it wasn't something you spoke about, they didn't feel comfortable talking about, they were actually very modest about their wartime bravery and courage. Um, but I think having now researched the book over 30 odd years on and off and written the story, I realized that he probably didn't want to talk about it because he didn't feel great about it. He didn't feel uh, perhaps that he'd done as much as he could do. He didn't feel certainly that he'd done as much as other people had done. Oh, I absolutely know he felt horrified about the friends and the comrades and the colleagues and the people who helped him who had died 
uh, when he was with them. And I know he felt, yeah, like so many, a sense of guilt and shame about that. So for me, it was um, certainly an act of curiosity and love on my part, but it was also a determination that my kids who are here today and my nieces would actually get to know what a great man their grandfather was. And um, I only wish I had known quite how great he was at the time when he was alive. Thank you, In the opening chapters of the book, you, you get a real feel for what it was like to be on the receiving end of the shock and awe of the German advance. Mm. And, the, and the, that terrifying moment for the retreat from Dunkirk. Mm. Clearly that evacuation is a well-known historical event, it's well documented as a big film two years ago. When you saw it through the eyes of your father, how did it feel different to you? Oh gosh, I think writing about Dunkirk was probably the most difficult time for me because we all know the story of Dunkirk, we all know the basics, we've all seen two or three films about Dunkirk. But I, I set myself to read about it and learn about it anew. I must have read about a dozen accounts, both sweeping historical strategic narratives and personal stories about Dunkirk. And um, my father, in fact, said nothing about it and left nothing behind about it. All I had was the account of uh, uh, Robin Medley, Robin Medley's son Guy is here somewhere, Guy. And Robin wrote an account about it, and I went back with Robin to Normandy with my son Tom, and we followed in their footsteps to some extent. And I'll never forget, Guy, the image of your dad, Robin, standing on the beach at Dunkirk again with his back to the sea and the wind ruffling his thinning grey locks and just suddenly seeing what it felt like for him and what it must have been like for all of them. And for me, having read all these accounts and knitted them together and then putting my father into the middle of it, my God, I, I spent mornings just staring at the page. I remember being in tears a lot of the time, just, God, how did they survive that experience? How did they do that? And, well, hey, live to tell the tale, but be live, live not to tell the tale, actually live for most of them, not to talk about it at all. And I mean, I did see the recent film of Dunkirk, and in my view, it doesn't tell the half of it. Not the half of it. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary time. Extraordinary rescue. The most, you know, Churchill didn't expect to take more than 45,000 men off the beaches. In fact, it was well over 300,000. The most extraordinary thing. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of luck involved. The Germans didn't advance as they might have done, etc., etc. But, you know, you're on that beach. You don't know if you're going to get off. The lines of men snaking out to sea. The stukas roaring overhead with their sirens wailing, bullets spattering the sand, men desperately digging into the sand for some kind of shelter. Oh. Terrible. It's some of the most touching scenes in the book I found were when you were standing somewhere where your father experienced incredible violence and trauma, and yet you were standing in a relatively tranquil space where mm -hmm. it's either quiet or just a routine of normal life. That was in Dunkirk, on the Lufthansa Islands in North Africa. Could you imagine, when you were standing there, what it was like for you? Well, I think, no. I mean, clearly not to the full extent. I mean, I have kept, been in some hairy situations in the Red Cross, as you have, as Mike has, and others in the room have. And I've, see, I've been in conflict situations and seen bullets, bullets fly. But usually they weren't aimed at me here in the building they might have been, but um, only metaphorically so. <laughs> um, uh, no, so, you know, I think of standing on the uh, hilltop in North Africa, where my, which my father had captured one night, and then the Germans had, count, had counterattacked at dawn the next morning. He lost any of his men in that battle, and eventually he had to surrender, and I mean, he felt bad about that. I just know he felt bad about that. 
but I stood on that hilltop, didn't we, darling? We stood on that hilltop, the wind was whistling, there was no shelter, no shelter at all. Those men on that hilltop were completely exposed. It was barren rock, and the Germans were all around them, and it was a lightning strike, a lightning counterattack. And uh, no, you can't, you can't imagine that. You, uh, you cannot imagine that. Not at all, I don't think, not fully. Talk a little bit about how you managed to put this book together. So, 1941, the army is now in the UK, it's off mainland Europe. They are training, there's an appetite to get to the back in the fighting to demonstrate they're capable of bringing the fight to the enemy. And the small group of commandos, of which your father was part, is sent to the Lufthansa Islands in Norway to try and disrupt official oil production, which is a critical supply for the German army. It's a sort of sideline-ish event within the grand scale of the conflict. How did you manage to piece together both what happened, but also the role that your father played? In, in, in particular, in the, in the left and right. As, well. as an example. Yeah. As an example. So um, all I had was the formal account by his military commander of that particular battle. Uh, this was, I mean, you know, base, this was the first commando attack of the war. It was an absolutely blatant piece of uh, propaganda, really, by Churchill. I mean, the whole commandos were Churchillian propaganda, you know, lightning ray, striking the enemy, you know, uh, striking back at the enemy after the disaster of, of Dunkirk. And um, uh, the, that first commando raid, yes, it, it had a military purpose, but its main purpose was to give heart to the British and to Strike, strike some sense of fear into the Germans. So all I had was the formal, you know, very strategically written, quite coolly cool account of that, um, that, that uh, attack. You know, the, the, the sailing across the North Sea, the attacking the Lofoten Islands. Uh, dawn, icy, icy dawn. It was so cold that as the men climbed up the rungs of the steel ladders on the jetties, their hands froze to the ladders and the, the skin was ripped off. Um, I had a great account by um, one of my father's fellow uh, troop leaders, uh, Lovett, Shimi Lovett, Lord Lovett. He wrote a wonderfully gung-ho account of that uh, battle. Of course, Evelyn War has also written he was in the same commando, although not in, in that particular fight. So I had a, a personal account. And Kelly and I went to the Foten Islands for a summer holiday. And for two weeks, we spent trying to, trying to work out um, you know, exactly where it was. And I couldn't get to the particular island that my father had attacked. So we just started asking around in shops and you know, the, the local boat hires. Anybody know how we can get to um, this store Emola, this little island? And uh, a lady we met offered to take us out there. No, offered to get us taken out there by somebody she knew. And the days of the holiday passed and nothing happened and nothing happened. And I went down to see her and she said, oh, well, I couldn't get in, but I tell you what, my husband's going to take you out there. So we went out. We sailed across the very sea that my father had sailed across. <coughs> we climbed up the steel ladder of the very jetty that he landed on. We saw the old... Um, fish oil factory there, we could see the tanks almost as they had been in 1941. And um, you know, that, was, that was such an important point for me, it was not just to read about it, but to go and see it. And so you just, you just start to imagine the story and imagine how it must have been. Um, I've been greatly aided, of course, by the MOD, greatly <coughs> aided Ministry of Defence, if you have I guess looking around, we're all of a generation. Um, you know, if you want to find out what your father did in the first, in the Second World War, you write to the Ministry of Defence. He'll send you his military service record, and you then go to the incredible National Archive at Kew. My goodness, that's the most incredible, incredible place. And they've got Shakespeare's will there, the Magna Carta. You name it, they've got it there, and they have got the Commander's War Diaries. Well. The Commander's War Diaries are the most exciting documents I have ever read. Every commander in the field had to keep a daily diary of what his unit was doing. And these documents, often handwritten, 
in fountain pen, pencil sometimes. You can just imagine the scene. It's late at night. It's been a hard day's fighting. And suddenly the guy thinks, oh, bloody hell, I haven't written the dial. You know, sits down on an old petrol can, starts scribbling away. What the hell did we do then? Oh, yes, we're going to do that. You know, these, are, these, these documents, they just deliver the originals to your desk in the National Archive. And you get to read all about it. And some of them are a bit sketchy, but some of them go into the most wonderful detail. And it all comes flooding, flooding in. It's very exciting. It's been a, a, on and off 30 years. I mean, odd days off, odd weekends. Uh, more recently, a bit of Googling. Although so when I started this, there was no Googling to be done. It was all, you know, finding old originals, a guy like your dad, and, and research to the National Archive. Now there's an awful lot of it available online. And it's incredibly exciting. Anybody who hasn't researched their father's or mothers, or history, and I do urge you to get on with it, because it's a great job. You've already alluded to a very dramatic moment in North Africa, um, and that's, well, I'll leave people to read exactly what happened in that battle, but it culminates with mostly being captured. Yeah. And he's in different captivity in different places with different qualities of life, but there were some characteristics of, sort of helplessness, disappointment, mm -hmm. monotony. How do you think the father coped with that period? Oh, he'd have been chafing at the bit for the whole time. Uh, there's no doubt that he was just really keen to get back into the fight, very frustrated at being cooped up, albeit in a relatively comfortable camp in Fontenolato in Italy, which is where he ended up. It's in North Italy, not far from Parma. It was an officer's camp, and it was a show camp. I mean, it was a camp quite deliberately designed, dare I say it, Mike, to impress the Red Cross and their inspection teams. You know, conditions weren't bad, the, the food was good, um, uh, lots of Red Cross parcels. Of course, the Red Cross parcels played a hugely important part in my father's time in prison and indeed with his fellow prisoners. Um, no, no, there was a bar, uh, believe it or not. They had a, a daily ration of martini and uh, wine. And if they didn't use their daily ration, they could flog, they could flog the vouchers to other prisoners. They used to save them up for parties. There's a wonderful account of one, um, he was a brigadier, Henry, actually one brigadier who drank so much at a particular party that when he left, he walked out through the door and it turned out to be the door of the wardrobe, not the door of, his, <laughs> of the room. I mean, it, so they had uh, quite a good time there, but there was a big desire to escape. Lots of escape schemes, which of course are all read, written about in the book. And then finally, they got this big chance to escape. Um, Italy was difficult to escape from because actually the Italians were very good guards. They were very observant, keenly interested in people. I mean, we all know this from our Italian friends. And uh, so it was quite difficult to get away, quite difficult to dig tunnels, although they did. Um, extremely difficult to get out through the wire because the Italians were very quick to shoot. Um, and so I think only six prisoners actually made it back from Italy. Uh, before the armistice, an Italian armistice, September 1943, the Italians laid down their arms and joined the Allies, effectively, or tried to. And um, at that moment, senior British officers in several of the camps said, chaps, if you want to get away, now's the moment to do it. Even though those same British officers had been told from London, stay put. It's a very famous stay put order that was issued allegedly on Montgomery's instructions because he didn't want lots of desperate you know, POWs sloshing about in Italy, blowing up bridges that the arm, Montgomery's army might want to cross, getting in the way, just generally being a bit of a nuisance even though they might have thought they were helping out. So Montgomery's instruction was stay put, but in many camps they didn't. And the senior British officer said, chaps, if you want to go, go now. And my dad was very quick to take him up on that offer and then had six months on the run. And that, and that moment I think is described beautifully in the book. One, that dilemma that you can go, but where do you go? Yeah. Um, and then the sort of dramatic six months. And there's one scene I particularly like where your father's in a, in a cow shed with someone from South Africa, Russia yeah. and France. Yeah. And it just said, t tells you how the world was turned upside down by that conflict, that you could find these people from all around the world hiding in a cow shed. 
in, in the Italian mountains. Yes, tremendous camaraderie, of course, amongst the escapers and the refugees, yeah. all the Italian deserters from the Italian army who were all desperately trying to get home in Italy and avoid the German patrols. The Germans came down incredibly swiftly from the north as soon as Italy capitulated. And so they had only a very few days. I mean, my dad got out of the camp. Uh, he stayed around the camp for a couple of days, went back to the camp two, after he'd been out for two days, and already the Germans had occupied it. They carted off the Italian commandant, a very nice guy called Vici Domini, beaten him up very seriously, and uh, occupied the camp, ransacked it, and then moved off into the countryside looking for escape prisoners. So he, they, he was lucky to get away, as so many of them were. And in that escape, you've got a beautiful landscape, villages that are people, medieval villages in some ways, in the lifestyle you lifestyle we were describing. You have a great deal of fear, cold, hunger, but a great deal of kindness and hospitality too. How did you piece that together? Oh, gosh. Well, so, um, the first clue to my father's war was this little notebook, which I found in Dad's bedside table about two days after he died. And I quickly looked through it, and my father's writing was even worse than mine, actually, so it was quite difficult to read, Paula. <laughs> quite difficult to read. But I, I, I realised that it was some kind of a diary. And although there were no names in it, there were no um, place names in it, I, I quickly realised that it was a diary of a time when he was a prisoner in Italy and had been on the run. And I mean, I vaguely know this. He had, this had somehow been knowledge within the family, but he never talked about it to me, he never talked about it to my mother. Uh, so that was the first clue about this story. Um, I worked out that he was at a camp somewhere in North Italy, and then quite by chance I read an absolutely amazing book by a guy called Eric Newby, a famous travel writer, who wrote a book called uh, Love and War in the Apennines. And I happened, quite by chance, to get that book out of the library. And I got about 20 pages in, in, into it, and I suddenly thought, hang on a second, this is the same camp. And I wrote to him, and it was the same camp, and he remembered my father. And so that gave me a clue, a, just the, the, the whole circumstances of the camp, and knew his wonderful descriptions of life in the camp, and the kind of the, the old that the public school boys who set up this wonderful sort of gambling club, they gambled on anything and everything in Fontenelata, and uh, you know, Newby particularly enjoyed that. My father, I think he wouldn't have been into that. He was more into plumbing and um, <laughs> learning about building work. His father was a builder, and I think he knew that was his destination after the war, was to go back to plumbing. But anyway, Newby enjoyed the gambling much more. And um, so Newby taught me about the camp, but he also taught me about the incredible kindness of the Italians. And this, for me, has been the absolute revelation of the process I've been through in writing the book, uh, the work that I do with my dear friends in the Monte San Martino Trust, which is a little trust set up by uh, former POWs in Italy who set up an organisation uh, as a means of saying thank you to the Italian people who helped our fathers escape. Uh, we give bursaries each year to young Italians from the villages that protected the prisoners to come over to England for a month each year and learn some English. It's a small thing. But we are saying thank you to people who risked their lives to help our parents. I mean, every single village where they helped prisoners escape they were risking their own lives, their families' lives, in many cases, the lives of their neighbours in the village. Uh, whole villages were, were taken out and shot for helping POWs and partisans. Um, we, so, so, you know, I owe my life, there's no question at all that I owe my life to those Italian uh, villagers who looked after my dad and many other escaped prisoners. Uh, the great kindness that they showed to strangers is a, is a real lesson to us all. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing to have really learnt and understood about that. And I have been back, Kelly and I visited all 48 of the villages, hamlets really, right up in the Apennine Mountains, who helped my particular father. He, although he didn't mention their names in here, he kept a list, 
which he'd made up after the war. I guess he must have got hold of a map. He kept a list of all 48 of these little places. We visited every single one of them. In every single one of them, we left um, a notice pinned up to the door of a church, pinned up in a bar, pinned to a tree. In Italian, picture of my father, somebody in this community helped my dad in 1943-44. We've just come back to say thank you. And of those 48 villages, 38, 30 have responded to my little letter of thanks. Oh, it's a fantastic, thank you so much for coming back. My father, my grandfather, you know, have responded to just being there and saying thank you. It's been wonderfully heartwarming. And through that trip, we have met people whose families definitely helped my father. And there's a lot about that in the book. And we have some family in the room, I understand. Well, um, <coughs> there were two, there were two, the one particular family, um, who uh, really did make the ultimate sacrifice for my father. Two very brave young Jewish partisans called uh, Eugenio and Sylvia Elfa met up with my dad when he was staying in a small village called Covaro. It's about 70 miles from Rome. He was right at the end of his trip and he caught pneumonia and uh, needed to be very carefully nursed back to health. And then while he was being nursed back to health, the snows came and he got snowed in. And while he was snowed in, he met these two young uh, Jewish partisans. Uh, Eugenio was 23, Silvia was 19. And they had lived in Rome with their, in their quite wealthy family uh, before the war. And they knew Rome and its environs, and particularly the beaches at Anzio and the mountains, the Abruzzo mountains nearby, very well. And they offered to guide my father and a New Zealander he was travelling with down through... So, so, actually, I need to go back a bit. This is, we're talking now January 1944. The Allies, the Americans and the British, have just landed at Anzia. This is the big main Allied invasion of Italy. And... Um, Thousands and thousands of troops have just landed on the beach at Antia, and the Germans have raced down to try and push them back into the sea. So there's one hell of a battle going on. Both sides bombing the life, by bombing hell out of each other, basically. And my dad, a New Zealander, lands up in the middle of this, and these two very brave young Italians offer to guide them through the Italian, through the German lines, the German minefields to the American lines at Anzio. And this is a five-day trip through the mountains. It's February, the weather is appalling, the snow and slush and ice and rain. Uh, German troops thick on the ground, minefields thick and thick on the ground too. They had to crawl their way through these minefields, hanging on to each other's ankles. Um, uh, they got through the German lines, they get through the German, the, the German minefield, and then they ran into a German patrol. And the German patrol opened fire. And it killed the young boy, Eugenio, and seriously wounded another guy who was with him. Sylvia, his sister, wanted to stay with his body. And my dad and the New Zealanders said, look, you can't, this is madness, you'll be killed, you've got to come on with us, we've got to get on to the American lines. And so they did, and they carried on. This is dead of night, they're in the middle of no man's land, they carry on crawling on their hands and knees. And then they're spotted by an American patrol. And imagine this, you know, this is the middle of no man's land, it's dawn, you're a nervous American sentry, just landed in Italy, you've been there a few days, you don't know what the hell's going on, except there's a massive, you know, mother of all battles and you see shadowy figures walking about, you know, it, crawling about in no man's land. What are you going to do? You open fire. And Sylvia was hit in the throat. The New Zealander was hit in the arm. My father managed to get into a ditch and shouted and screamed for them to stop shooting. And eventually they did and my dad carried Sylvia's body into the American lines and she died in the hospital uh, on the beach at Antio uh, the next day. Now, um, my father never mentioned this. It's not mentioned in his diary. Um, 
the only clue I had to it was a tiny little newspaper cutting referring to a burial that took place in the Jewish cemetery in Rome in 1946, as a year after the war ended, uh, referring to the burial of a, a woman called Sylvia Elfa. And um, I googled that name one Sunday afternoon and up came a link to a family in America who knew that Sylvia Elfa was some kind of relation to them and she had somehow died in Italy helping Allied soldiers escape. So I was able to get in touch with this family in Italy and hear their side of the story. By this time I'd also been in contact with the family of the New Zealander who escaped with my father and had heard what he had to say about Sylvia and Eugenio Elfa. And then, through the Monte San Martino website, which my friend John Simpkins yeah. runs, um, I got an email out of the blue from Anthony and Peter Elfa, who are uh, cousins on the male side of the Elfa family. And I'm absolutely thrilled to say Anthony and Peter Hilfer are here today. We have since been able to exchange lots of information about these incredible two young people. Uh, Helly and I have spent now two mornings sitting by their grave in the Jewish cemetery in Rome. It, it is an incredible story which is told in the book, the story of these two young people of their father who died almost immediately he heard that they had been killed, of their mother who went back to Anzio, found her daughter's body in the American War Cemetery at Anzio, and her son's body still lying in the ditch where he had died two years earlier. She brought their bad body back to be buried with her husband, and where she is now buried, she, having lived to the age of 105. <laughs> and um, I, can I just <coughs> tell one more little bit? Um, I'm giving away the book. You hardly need to buy it now. <laughs> well, actually, you do. But uh, um, so we, the second time we visited this grave, we found a fresh white flower on it. This was who could be around now? Who could remember these two young people? Who's putting this, who has put this fresh white flower there? So we left a note. And two weeks later, I got a, an email from Sandro Sonino, whose mother, it turns out, is buried in the next row in the Jewish cemetery in Rome. And he wrote and said, um, my mother died recently and in visiting her body, I happened to notice the grave of these two young people and the little story, the, the essence of the story that's carved on their headstone. And he said, I decided that um, every time I come to visit my mother, I'm going to lay a fresh white flower on the grave of these two young people. So there you are. We will remember them. Nick, uh, that was a, a, a great interview. As you say, we will remember them. We are remembering them. Um, uh, but it's your father's story is amazing. Escaping with his life uh, from Dunkirk to D-Day and beyond, escaping from prisoner of war camp, getting back in. We didn't get to D-Day. So what happened? What happened there? So uh, he got back to the Allied forces after escaping in Italy. Uh, he was on a boat out of Naples within two days of arranging Sylvia Elfa's funeral. Uh, he got back to London uh, a couple of weeks later and within a couple of weeks after that he was back in Northern Europe. He, he landed on the, uh, the Mulberry Harbour uh, and uh, fought his way through Normandy, uh, Belgium, uh, took part in the rescue of the troops at, um, at uh, Arnhem and then fought his way through to the German border, which he, he got to the German border in December 1944. And by that time, uh, he and his, his company of, of the Queen's Regiment had lost so many men that they decided to amalgamate uh, three companies of Queen's uh, into one. 
and they decided that the old soldiers, the people who'd been in the war from the beginning, should go home. And so my father was repatriated at that point, having literally been right through the war from uh, Dunkirk to D-Day and beyond. I mean, it is amazing that people were just going straight back. I mean, immediately after Dunkirk, that people went back uh, and they just kept coming. I, I, I mean, it's hard for us to imagine that today, isn't it? It really is. It, you know, they must, you think they must all have been so damaged by what they saw in the various theatres of war that they, they were engaged in. How on earth could they manage? But, you know, um, the human spirit is an incredible thing. They had a cause to fight for that they all passionately believed in and felt absolutely certain was the right cause. And perhaps that was enough to get over what we would now think of as post-traumatic stress syndrome. You, you know, they didn't get a chance, they weren't offered the opportunity to talk about it and they didn't talk about it, they just got on with the next thing. Um, I don't know, I, I find it hard to imagine myself, Torin, very hard. And when you see Pat and Jean Outram just talking in their 90s uh, about it, I mean, that, ge that generation had something very special. I think it was a, a very special generation. Uh, I was very uh, interested and moved in Pat and Jean's story. My, my, uh, one of my early inspirations in my uh, voluntary sector career was Sue Ryder. And Sue Ryder was with, would have been with Jean in the Fanny and the SOE. And Sue Ryder put a, uh, was uh, parachuted into East Germany at the end of the war and helped to uh, rescue um, the victims in the concentration camps in, in Poland and East Germany. And, you know, my, she, she had that, you know, that indomitable spirit, that, that just sort of things, we've got to do this stuff and let's just get on and, and do it. And they didn't question it. And I, 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 heard, I heard that in Pat and Jean. I mean, they're incredible decision young girls we're going to f our dad's fighting we're going to fight too um mm. that's, that's absolutely wonderful spirit and yeah you sometimes you i hear myself whinging about you know the lockdown and all the rest of it. I think, hang on a second all i've got to do is to sit on the sofa they had to go <laughs> and fight in a foreign land you know really? we don't yeah. know the half of it that, that's my dad up there by the way that's i can see him i can see him there <laughs> Uh, yeah. Leslie Young, Major Leslie Young, what, yeah. what a fantastic career. But you obviously had a great deal of um, fun, but also pleasure in finding out about it. And I, I was very interested to hear what you're saying about the National Archives at Kew, which is just up the road here from, from Chiswick. But I didn't know that. They got all those original documents. Oh, they, they are absolutely incredible. It was a complete revelation to me uh, because, you know, I, I got the sort of two page service record about my father from the Ministry of Defence. I didn't really know what to do with that and somebody vaguely mentioned the National Archives so I, I toddled along there one one day off and yeah then you know they just showed me what to do, showed me how to use the index and then all of a sudden there were these Commander's War Diaries sitting in front of me and as I, I described in that interview they are the most incredible document mm -hmm. and it is all there. If you're prepared to take the time and trouble, you, you can find out so much about, about those days. And, and really, you know, eyewitness accounts written at the, at the time, um, you, you can't beat it. And, you know, they, they still have the whiff of cordite about them, these documents. I, again, I described an interview. You just imagine, you know, that whoever was in charge of writing the diary, that, oh, damn, I haven't written the diary. You know, I've got to sit down on a, oh, did anybody pencil anyone, you know? Wow, it, it was just it's all there. Absolutely. And then wonderful that you discovered Eric Newby's book and there was uh, all the detail of the camp. Yeah, well, Eric, Eric's book is, is a great. I, I had read all Eric's books and this just happened to be one I hadn't read. And uh, he writes a great description of, of the camp at Fontenolato. He, he makes it uh, sound very funny. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't entirely funny, but it, it clearly was quite a pleasant camp by comparison with, with many. And um, yeah, his, his own escape adventures are told in Newby's inimitable style, Torin, which I'm sure you will know very well. Uh, it's almost a laugh a page. But I mean, at the same time, very serious. I mean, the, the Italian peasant farmers, the contadini, 
they they were incredibly brave i mean these people had nothing next to nothing they lived very meager lives up in the apennine mountains uh, they were all sharecroppers you know 50 percent of everything they grew went to the landlord the rest was just enough for them to survive on and yet when the prisoners uh, and there were you know there were actually there were thousands of prisoners on the loose in italy at this time when the prisoners came knocking on their door many of them said yes come in mangiare here have something to eat they, they were put to put to bed in the barn or whatever and sent on their way after breakfast the next morning and you know again as i said at the in the interview they were risking their lives there was a price on the prisoners heads and there was a price on the head of anyone who helped the prisoners and we, we heli and i on our visit to these 48 villages in italy we we saw several villages where a plaque on the wall commemorated the day when the Germans marched in and shot all the men or shot all the women. I mean, yeah, it was it was very serious what they did, incredibly generous what they did to help all these prisoners. And as I say again, I owe my life to those Italian uh, contadini. And how wonderful that uh, you went back and uh, and told them so. Uh, and 30 of them responded. Yeah, well, that was that was a great trip. I mean, it was it was the Apennine Mountains are absolutely stunningly beautiful. My father did it in sort of seven or eight feet of snow. We did it in a wonderful sunny autumn. Yeah. Um, we visited them all. We had some great experiences. We were made incredibly welcome. Uh, we stayed with, we, we met and, and uh, stayed with a couple of families who actually had helped my father, who I'm now in regular contact with. And that, that spirit of hospitality and generosity is still very much alive and well in Italy, in the Apennine Mountains. Well, Nick, it's a wonderful book. Um, I'm going to urge everybody to buy it, Escaping With His Life uh, through Pen and Sword Books. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that story with us and bringing to an end these three sessions marking the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II.